The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. If you're visiting, we are grateful to have you here with us to worship our God together. Today, uh, on Monday, we're going to be celebrating Memorial Day, and we are grateful for everyone who has served this country to give us the freedoms to open this Word of God and declare Jesus Christ uh, with all of our hearts in freedom. So if you've served in the military, we'd like you just to stand up, and we wanted to honor you this morning for your service. Amen. Well, we've taken a little break in our study in Second Peter with Mother's Day. Pastor Killian brought us the word and in great encouragement to mothers. And then my dear brother Mike DeVries was with us last week, and we just desire to keep these strong affiliations with uh, our other churches and sisters, and so we are so thankful for that sister church. This morning, we're going to take back up in Second Peter, so if you'll turn with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2, and I just feel like since it's been two weeks, it warrants a little bit of review. So we're going to review just a little bit. Um, Chapter 1 is just so rich and very positive where Peter's calling us to confirm our election. And we're doing it by availing ourselves to God's power through faith and the precious, magnificent promises in Jesus Christ And the chief one being that this gospel brings you to have koinonia fellowship, that you can now share and have oneness with Jesus Christ. And so what a glorious promise that this gospel brings you to God to stand in His presence, accepted, loved, and one with our Savior. Then in chapter 2, it's kind of turned a little more negative. It's, It's a sad picture of false teachers who creep into the church. And they don't avail themselves to the promises of Jesus Christ. And thus they don't come out of the corruption that the, of, of the, the lusts that are in this world that he talked about in verse 4 of chapter 1. And they have greed. And they have sexual desire that leads their listeners into the same demise that they live into. And so the exhortation that Peter's given to us all, make certain you're calling an election, that you have been saved by God by the sure word of God, not by emotions, feelings, what you think, create your own religion. It is through the word of God that was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to make us godly and to grow into conformity of Jesus Christ. And so that is what Peter wants to leave the church as he knows his death is soon coming. Here's what you need if you're going to make it to the finish line. It's truly what I want to leave to this church and what my passion is for every one of you to have sitting here this morning. And so the key is what we've seen in Peter's second epistle is this word epithumias, which means desires that are over. And, and he's saying you're going to have desires for this world and its lusts, or you're going to have this overarching desire for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way to overcome these battles with earthly desires and wrong desires, but with the supreme greatest desire for the Lord Himself. Will you fight the flesh and the world and its system and the devil by the power of knowing Jesus Christ? Or will you indulge indulge in His power to drive out these lesser affections? And so that is the broad way and the narrow way. One leads to life and one leads to death. And so that is what is before us. And I'm just seeing it so clear, almost too clear. We're in a battle, and the battle belongs to the Lord for life and godliness. And so I am praying for every one of us to journey into this deeper conformity unto Jesus Christ. So let's go to the throne of grace and pray Like that is what's at stake here is eternal life and eternal death. And these things need to matter to you more than anything else, more than the battles and the worries of this world. We've got to let these things be the most important thing that drive us and quit whining and complaining about lesser things and getting lost in these things that aren't eternal. This is a call for all of us. This is is where you're going to spend eternity 
And he's showing us the battle in First, Second Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so let's go to our God and ask for, for battle array. Oh, Father, we come before you and I pray that wake anyone up who's meandering, anyone who's drowsy and sleepy toward the King of Kings. God, nibbling at the table of these earthly pleasures and delights have numbed them and just made them sleepy. And I just pray, Lord, what we are looking at is so glorious that to, to be able to look at this and just say, ah, so what? God, break it. Wake us up to the beauties of what you are showing us by your Holy Spirit through our servant, Peter. And God, I pray this morning that you'll take these words and you will uh, enlighten our minds and our hearts. Teach us again about these false teachers and how to avoid them. But let us avoid them so that we will go to the true teacher. That we'll come to the one who is the word. We'll come to the one whose sheep will hear his voice. God, I pray chapter one for every soul here in this place. And I pray for chapter two that every one of us by your grace would avoid these lies and the deceptions that are to lead us away from Jesus Christ. God, wake us up to them. Help us not to just not can be concerned about this and just think, oh, that could never happen to me. God, there, there are some sitting here this morning who have already been led into this daze and dullness. And I just pray that you would use the word of God here this morning to do what no human being can do by your spirit. Do it, we pray. Amen. Here's your outline. <clears throat> As we've been journeying in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 3, Peter showed us a portrait of false teachers. He says they're going to be in your midst. They're going to deny the master who's bought them. They're going to be driven by sensuality and greed. Uh, uh, the five senses are what guide them, not Christ. Their lust uh, drive their interpretation of Scripture. Because I want to live a certain way, I've got to get Scriptures that fit and clear my conscience and make it okay to live this way. And so false teachers will twist and manipulate Scriptures to fit their lifestyle of lust. Secondly, in verses 4 through 10, we examine the punishment that will come to the false teacher. And we looked at the angels in Genesis, and they were thrown into Tartarus in this waiting place when they cohabited with humans. And then we looked at the flood, where God brought a flood upon the whole earth for the rejection of him and sin. And then we looked at Sodom and Gomorrah that was reduced to ashes for all of their immorality and homosexuality that was going on in that city. And so the message is, is that God knows how to punish these teachers. And he knows how to punish those who live in these ways. Then our third point is the presumption. The presumption in uh, 10b through 12. And we're going to look at that this morning. And then we'll look next week, or I'm sorry, then we're going to look at their practices. What, what, what do these false teachers look like? So they have a, they have a prideful presumption and how do they live? How do we spot them? And he's going to actually share their, their message, uh, how they live, uh, and, and how they, they have pride. And then the, the end, we'll look at verses 20 through 22 at the product. What, what is the end result if we buy into this false teaching and our false teachers as well? And it will be a destructive end. So this morning, I want to take up then our third point. If you'll look with me at the presumption then, of these false teachers. And you'll come to chapter 2, verse 10. And he says, especially those who indulge the flesh, flesh in its corrupt desires, and they despise authority. That's where we left off. And now Peter says they're daring, self-willed, and they don't tremble when they revile angelic majesties. And so this might come as no surprise, but these false teachers are going to carry with them a great pride. They're going to be very self-confident. There's a cockiness to them. There's no fear of the battle that we are in with the battle of darkness. There's, there's kind of a smugness. We're invincible. And they're going to come just preaching all of these things with no respect for the battle that we're in. Ephesians 6, Paul laid out all the glories of the doctrines and how we should live as Christians. And he said one last thing is there's going to be a great battle. You're, you're, you're not on the love boat but you're on a battleship on the way to glory. And there's going to be warfare. And you need to put on the believer's armor if you're going to stand and make it to the end. And so Paul says there's a battle. And you need to respect the battle. 
and the need for the Lord because we are not sufficient to battle this enemy in our own resources. If you've got some false teaching and you believe I can just take on the devil, you're wrong. You don't have the resources, and Paul calls them out. They're from God, and he will give you his resources in this battle. And so they come, these false teachers, and they talk about some formula. You, you do this formula, and the demons run from you. Here's a little methodology that you can just cast them out. And this arrogance towards evil forces will fill their teaching. And we just toss these demons all over the place like we got some kind of authority. Verse 10. He says, what you are then is their daring. And it's interesting, this is a noun. It could be better translated, their dares. This is what they are, who they are, their very person. They're just daring. They're defiant. This Greek word means to deny God. They're just daring, and I dare you, God, I can do what I want. They give no thought to what we looked at last time, that judgment is going to come upon these teachers. There's an arrogance to it. God will never judge me. There's no reverence for the accounting that's going to come at the end of their lives for what they're doing, how they're living, what they're teaching, and those who are following it. There's no fear. God isn't going to judge me. I'll just keep doing this. There's no thought to denying the master who owns them. They're just bold and brash and audacious, these teachers. The adjective of this word, if you look at the second one, is self-willed. They're self-willed. They're bent on their own way. A whole elder board will stand up against them and they'll stand in defiance with a battery on their shoulder. Go ahead, I dare you to knock it off. They, they lie, they deceive, they manipulate, they will not repent and they will not back down. Nothing will stop them. Truth will not stop them. The master who bought them will not stop them. Judgment at the end of your life will not stop them. They're just self-willed and daring, audacious. Stand up. And thirdly, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. And this is kind of a tricky little phrase. <clears throat> There's a lot of different thought on it. And so what I want to do is I want to break it down and see if we can lay hold of what Peter means by this phrase. The word revile means to blaspheme, to degrade, to ridicule, or to mock. And so they will blaspheme, ridicule, mock angelic majesties. And so angelic is angels, but I'll ask you this, which ones? Are they fallen angels or are they good angels? Which ones are they mocking? And in verse 11, he transitions to show us the good ones. So they'll, they'll actually, uh, they, they, let me just read it because I'm forgetting it. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power, that's the good ones, do not bring a reviling judgment against these false uh, fallen angels before God. So here's the tricky part then is majesties. And the Greek word is doxa, where we get the word Glory. And so my question is, how can demons, fallen angels, be called doxa? I think simply because they were created by God. And I just want to read a few verses that Peter uses this same word, and I just want to show you the beauty of this word. In 1 Peter 1.11, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow that would come from the sufferings of of Christ. Uh, write down 2 Peter 1 3, and I'll read 2 Peter 1 17. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, Jesus, the, well, at that transfiguration, he received doxa. And so this is tricky. We're kind of on a razor's edge here this morning, is we don't give glory to demons in any way. But we must have respect for how God made them and for what purpose and what role they play in redemptive history this morning. They're still marked by the quality of their creation. It's just used for evil now. And so they're spiritual beings where? In high places. They're in high places, 1 Corinthians 15, 40. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. And so here's my question. How can cursed, damned demons be reviled 
or blasphemed by these false teachers. And so these fallen angels are not to be taken lightly. They're not just some little guy with a pitchfork. It's very serious beings on a very serious mission to destroy your faith and steal glory from God. They're very serious about it. (laughs) They're given over to it. And so you cannot have a flippancy regarding Satan and his fallen angels, the demons. You can't have flippancy. Uh, There was a guy for younger people, he was an old comic named Flip Wilson. And Flip Wilson used to always say, the devil made me do it. And it was a big joke. All the mockings. These false teachers are going to stand up with this arrogance and they're going to speak this way. And, and there's not a respect for what God has made and what is against us in this battle. So what Peter's talking about here on a daily basis is on our television and they're on programs and they're in books and blogs. I read them almost every day. Daring, self-willed teachers calling Satan out and demanding and telling him what he can and cannot do. For instance, TBN. And it's just all day long. Here's what the devil can do. Here's what he can't do. We toss him around. We call him out. And you get large followings when you stand up to Satan. And what is he doing in this world? We're going to bind him and we're going to cast him out in all of our sayings and our prayers and formulas. I bind you, Satan, from my home. Come cast Satan out of my home so everything good happens in my house. Who doesn't want a false teacher like that? i just going to cast out the demon of lust and it's gone. They underestimate the power of Satan and they mock him and they slander him or the liberals just flat out say he doesn't exist. Both of them are false teachers. And the arrogance is that I can tell Satan what to do and I can direct Satan around. And I can get a following by doing this. And I'll tell you this, is my greed can get people to give me money so I can cast Satan out of their lives and any destruction that he can bring to it. Because who doesn't want Satan out of their lives and anything bad that can come to you? Is there anyone who doesn't want that? <laughs> you know, just I'll, give me your money and I'll get Satan out of your life and you won't have any more problems. I'll, I'll pay you great money for that blessing. And then look with me then in verse 11. So they're daring and self-will and they don't tremble when they revile these angelic doxa majesties, these fallen angels. Whereas angels, the good ones, who are greater in might and power, do not bring a reviling judgment against these fallen angels before the Lord. This is crazy. Angels with way more power and might than we have, the good ones, Don't run around talking like these false teachers. They don't bring a reviling judgment upon them. Holy angels entrust it to God, and they hand it over to Him to be the one who brings the judgments and declares them. So these false teachers do what even the good angels don't do, pronouncing judgments upon the fallen angels. And they will will get right up in their faces, and no fear These guys are daring, and women, they're they're daring and self-will, and they declare what what these demons must do in their power and what they can say. Listen to Jude 1, 8-9, which you'll remember Jude is almost a carbon copy of 2 Peter 2. And Jude says, In the same manner, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh, and they reject authority, and they revile angelic majesties. And this is interesting. He says, Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. And so it's not recorded in Scripture. I didn't know about this battle unless you read it in Jude. And somehow there was a battle over Moses' body, and I, I bet it was a demonic thing is if we can get Moses' body, we can get people to worship it, get them away from God. And so there's some debate over Moses' body, but it, his point is just saying the angels didn't speak like false teachers, the good ones, to these reviling bad ones. So these false teachers, I want you to catch it then, they're so brash, and I just want you to see what happens to them in verse 12. But these false teachers, like unreasoning animals, 
born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. And so now Peter comes and says, these teachers, false ones, are just like unreasoning animals. And some of you are like, Pastor, come on. You've rebuked us about sex, same sex, transgenders, and what is marriage. This, you just couldn't be any dumber to take all those on in one sermon. And now you want to take on the biggest of them all, animals? I've got Rudy, my little dog, and Bambi, and now Pastor's going to talk about animals. Yes, but I did not revile angelic majesties, did I? Okay? But I proclaimed God's unchanging absolute truth. And no matter what our culture says, these things do not change. And so they're, they're God's standard, and they're the, the path of blessing and righteousness. And so these standards, they need to be heralded. And so now he comes, and he says these false teachers are like unreasoning animals. In Romans 1, it says creation demands there's a God, and you suppressed it, and you would not glorify him, so he gave you over to a depraved mind. If you don't want to use your mind to worship the living God, that's why you have it, to understand Him and know Him, then I'm going to give you over and these minds now are going to act instinctual. You're just going to be like animals that don't have reasoning. And you're just going to go live out all your lusts and your desires. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar when he looked out at his kingdom and said, look what I've built? And God makes him like an animal and his fingers grow and hair and fangs. And it's like if you're not going to use your mind to worship the living God... You're going to become an animal. You're going to be just like an animal if you don't use this gift to know truth and know God and think and reason. Jeremiah said you're like wild horses neighing after your neighbor's wives. Guys, we were given intellect and mind and thought and reasonings because we've been made in the image of God. Such a gift to think through creation, why I exist, the Word of God, uh, what's coming, to worship Him. What a gift to have minds and to reason. But these false teachers have abandoned truth. And what are they driven now by? Their lusts, their desires, greed. No longer guided by rational thinking. No longer guided by epigenosis, the knowledge of Christ. That's what we saw in chapter 1. We're driven by knowing Christ and being intimate through truth with Him. And these teachers now are driven. They don't even use their minds. Everything is about lusts and desires. And there's some of you sitting here right now with, if we had to say, what drives your life? It's not truth. It's whatever you desire, whatever you lust, whatever you just chase. And that's what these false teachers are doing. They are just driven by lusts. Like animals, they don't have reason. And it's hard for me to tell you this. Your animals don't have reasoning skills. What? When I come home, Fluffy goes crazy and he licks my hand and he kisses me. You can't tell me that Fluffy doesn't have reasoning. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you straight truth because I love you. They don't love you because they thought out who you are and how much they love your personality. And if you need counseling afterwards, I'll be up here. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, that they're instinctual. And if you feed them, they appear to love you. And I have a dog that because Kelsey loves them, we, we've kept them. <laughs> and Laura and, and my father-in-law feed him, and he, he goes crazy every time they walk in the house. And so I just tested my hypothesis. I dropped the plate with a little bit of eggs left on it. And Rudy ran, ran over and just licked it up. And then he jumped on my lap. <laughs> After nine years of training him not to. That's not reasoning. That's instinct. It's not rational. Um, it's not like your wife or your husband where they, they know you and they think out, I love this about her, I understand this. And there's this, this beautiful relationship with your, them or your friends. And so I just want to make sure you're okay. But this is, a, this is a note that I do want to get off my chest. I love animals. They're a gift from God. 
They're an amazing common grace to us. I've seen them comfort believers. Many th- I, there is a beauty to, to animals. And they proclaim the glory of God because they do what they were designed to do where human beings don't. And so they just don't have reason. They're instinctual. And his point, <laughs> was to get me in trouble, is that these false teachers are just like them. Catch that. There's no reasoning to them. They're like animals driven by their passions, fulfilling their desires and instincts for greed and sex. And our verse says they're going to be destroyed. In the Greek, it says, in their destroying, they shall be destroyed. They're going to destroy you with their lies. And in them destroying you, they're going to be destroyed. The the greatest judgment in hell is for the false teacher because he led others into it. And we'll see that next week. Their destructive work through false teaching and unchecked passions, they themselves will be destroyed. And in verses 19 through 22, we will look at that. And it's some of the saddest verses I've ever looked at. And so next week uh, is intense. What you sow is what you will reap. Their lies, their pride, and their lustful passions will destroy them eternally. And so we've seen in verses 1 through 3 the portrait of these false teachers. We've seen the punishment that will come uh, from God in verses 4 through 10. And now we've looked at their presumption. They're just prideful, daring, self-willed, proclaiming uh, what the demons and devils have to do and follow them and all of these things. And now our fourth point I want to look at is what is their practices? How can we spot them? I want you to look in verse 13 through 16. Peter's now going to take a string of participles and adjectives and he's going to show why they're going to face judgment. Why is God going to bring judgment? So let's just, we'll move through them kind of quickly. And verse 12, but these, like unreasoning animals, they're they're like unreasoning animals. (coughs) They are born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Verse 13, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. That's tying into verse 12. So now in verse 13, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. And so what is this? I'm going to read to you Romans 13. And this do, knowing the time, that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Wake up. Salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. He's almost here. The night is almost gone. And the day, the return of Christ is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is 2 Peter chapter 1, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That's what this is. The world loves to do its sin and its debauchery at night, and the sign of a pagan society is daylight sin. And they're so given over that these ones cannot even wait until night. They start drinking and partying and sexual sins in the day. They're so consumed with sin. This is their true epithumia that that's all they can do day and night. False teachers are so brazen that they will do on on the daytime what most sinners will only do at night under the cloud of darkness. And just a a couple verses for your study, Ecclesiastes 10.16 and Isaiah 5.11, is that they'll they'll begin sinning in 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 the light out there, right there in public. Second, there's stains and blemishes. The word for stain means dirt spots. A blemish is a scab or a defect. They are dirty and they're diseased. They pollute everyone around them. All who they teach and all who they lead. Remember in Matthew 7, you'll know a false teacher by his fruit. The fruit will be just bad. Stains and blemishes. I heard we had a false teacher that I knew of and he started a home church. And while they were studying all this truth about freedom, which we'll see next week is their message, all the young kids were up looking at pornography on a computer during their church service. They're stains and blemishes. Thirdly, reveling in their deceptions. The freedom 
to sin and be sensual. These animal instincts, instincts of just drinking it up. They sit and they talk about this stuff all day long. They never tire of teaching it or following its moral end. They sit drinking beer and partying, talking about their amazing freedom, sharing how everyone else is a legalist or a Puritan or a prude who's seeking the holiness of Almighty God that Greg taught this morning in 1 Thessalonians 4. That you don't have our enlightenment. You need to understand that you have this freedom. And they just revel in this stuff. They deceive their hearers and they just get them to follow them. They love to get others to clear their conscience so they can prove that they're right. They don't like to do this alone. They like to draw other people into it. And it's just the devilishness of the whole thing. And then fourthly, they carouse with you. This word means, this is interesting, the Greek word means to feast together. It was the public meal. There's New Testament evidence that it was probably their love feast when they would gather and eat and have communion together. And so what he's saying is they're in your churches, they're at your fellowships, and they sit at your communion tables. And they're just filthy spots and scabs polluting your love feast with this junk and this false teaching. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty one, 21, For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. You're just getting drunk during the communion time. I knew of a church under this false kind of teaching with a, a false gospel, and they went from extreme legalist to libertine, and they would have women fellowship, and they would, they would get rides so they could all get drunk and not have to drive home, all in the name of Jesus Christ. They're in your love feasts with sensuality driving them. Be on guard from these. And so that's what they're like on the outside. And now quickly, Peter's going to tell us what they're like on the inside. If you'll look with me in verse 14. Having eyes full of adul adultery that never cease from sin. They're unreasoning animals. All that drives them is their lust and their passions. This is what is sovereign in their life. And now they can't even look upon a woman in the body of Christ and outside of course without seeing them as a potential adulteress. They're so debauched and so controlled by lust that every woman now is just someone to conquer for their pleasures or vice versa if it's a woman. No freedom in Christ. This is not a man battling his lusts or a woman because the glory of Christ in this gospel that we saw in 2 Peter 1, that in making every effort and stroking, swimming to this Christ likeness, swimming against the current, that's not what this is. But it's one who's so given over that his lusts just dominate every thought. You can't even sit through a sermon without lusting. You can't meet anyone. This is just the controlling principle of your life. Every woman is here for your sexual pleasure and control. It's all you think about. And he says that they never cease from sin. It doesn't take a pause because they can't stop. It can't be turned off. It's just a relentless wanting of more. That's what greed is. Greed is never satisfied. It just has to have more. And their sensualities just keep driving. I've got to have more, more, more. It's a hunger that cannot be filled. Certainly not what we saw in chapter 1 of the beauties of Christ that can fill a heart and a soul and satisfy it like nothing else. And then they entice unstable souls. They go after the weak ones. Not the strong and the mature in the faith, uh, the ones with discernment. They're always looking around for the weak ones that they can draw into this false teaching and their lusts. They look for the ones who are weak, unstable, easily shaken and turned and twisted on a dime, not deep doctrine, understanding. They don't like those. And when they see these ones, hey, you want to get coffee so we can go out and talk? I don't like what, what pastor said in that sermon. Here's a better way to understand it. They entice them into their teaching and the objects of their greed and lust. They entice, that Greek word means to catch with bait. They just throw out big worms. Here you go, bite it, I got you. And they call it counseling. Helpful, compassion. I just would like to pray for you. And they'll throw out these baits and they'll get you. 
Brethren, be on guard for these slithery, tricky scoundrels that Peter says will come into our midst. And he says they have a heart trained in greed. Sex and greed go hand in hand. So these teachers have been trained in greed to go after whatever their heart desires. They have, what did we see in chapter 1? That we have self-control. These ones have no self-control, no repentance, just passions. And he says they have a cursed children and all the studies I could tell. Some people think that it's just this passing down of a curse to their, their children when they're born and it just keeps going. But the, the best commentators I could come up with on this is they said, whatever is the dominant influence of your life, you're a child of it. So it's just Peter once again declaring their destruction that is coming upon them. They're just accursed. And in verse 15, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They've forsaken truth and obedience. That's America today. That's Christianity in America. We've gone astray and we've strayed from the word and from the truth and, and we're out of orbit, as Jude called it. We're wandering, just, just drifting. There's only two ways, the way of righteousness and the way of wickedness. And, and these ones have just taken the course of wickedness. And then he says, they've gone astray having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness but he received a rebuke for his own transgression for a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. And so we'll close out with this point and take up next week with the rest should the Lord tarry. <clears throat> they followed the way of Balaam and I'm just going to close this point. Balaam was a prophet who spoke for God. The Moabites, the, uh, the Israelites are coming and they, they're, they're afraid of them because they're so large and they, they don't want to go to battle and they're scared so they call Balaam the prophet. Uh, there could have been he had a reputation that he could be bought. But they tell him, we'll pay you a large sum of money if you will curse Israel so we can defeat him in war. And Balaam, it might have been a false piety because many of the false teachers have it. He says, I can only speak the word of the Lord. And most likely pushing up the price, which he did. And Peter comes and he looks at Balaam and says he loved the benefits of money more than faithfulness to God. And so get this, the false prophet's true premium is his love of money. And Balaam was a prophet for profit. Balaam says he will go prophesy then against Israel. And while he's traveling to do it, the donkey sees the angel of the Lord with a sword there uh, to destroy Balaam. And so the donkey stops. And Balaam is so mad, he's just beating this donkey. What's wrong with you? Keep going. And he's beating him. And finally the donkey says, why are you doing this? And the funny part is, is Balaam's donkey rebukes him. And he protects him from death. He's an unreasoning animal. And Balaam had less insight into God's dealing than a donkey. <laughs> that, I should preach a sermon on that. That's beautiful. The donkey had more reasoning than Balaam. And so the point that Peter is making, Balaam was greedy and he prophesied for money along with greed and immorality. This stuff is all around us. And some are more obvious, but the best are the ones who are in our love feasts. And next week we'll look at their message and the prophet. And so as I close out, I'm just some application. I, I might just save it for next week, but I'll just give you two of them instead of all five. I want to give a warning against false teachers. I, I believe that too many play around with them in their own lives. And your elders will warn you. I, almost everyone I've ever warned of false teaching, they, they shake it off and say, oh, I'm not worried about it. I, I, I dealt with a false teacher once, and everyone I warned about it who went that way, I saw the corruption that came from it. We just, this, this country doesn't want to judge anyone, does it? We're just to the point you can't judge anything. And this Word of God says inside the church we judge. We judge one another and we confront one another and we, we look at truth and we assess it and we reject false teaching. And so what I'm going to tell you is there's an eternity at stake. And we've got to start taking serious the truths that will feed and grow and have us hold on to the very end, uh, confirm our election. We've got to hold to those and fight hard against the lies that are all around us in this country. I need you to fight with me 
to protect ourselves from this teaching and the destruction that it brings that leads to licentiousness and takes the edges off men, women, and children who want to fight for holiness. I've seen so many go down with this licentious teaching in the name of freedom, and we've got to fight it. And then I just close maybe with just, if you're visiting and you've come here, I want you to see that, that, that those testimonies you heard were so beautiful. And that's what the power of Christ does. It, it broke the dominion of sin in both of their lives. They were dominated and controlled and couldn't get out of it. And they see this gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're testifying to true freedom. Freedom to be holy. Freedom to walk out of a house with no money because she doesn't want to sin with her boyfriend. Freedom. Freedom that comes in this gospel. And so I pray that you would look at the truth of Jesus Christ. And if you sit here still a slave of all your corruptions and all your sin, you need the gospel of Jesus Christ that breaks the power of canceled sin. And so I pray this morning that you would look at something better than your own resolve, your own strength, the law. None of those can deliver. False teaching that will just make you be comfortable in your sin and tell you it's all okay. I'm telling you there is a gospel of a Christ who saves to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. So if you've come in here this morning, I, I call you to repent from wrong thinking and wrong living and come to the sweet Jesus Christ by faith. And, and have your sins forgiven. And the power of that will begin to change and transform you from one image of glory to the next. And I'm going to beg you to quit sitting and buying the lies that are in our country that you can live any way you want and sin and just play around with Jesus. I, I renounce that false teaching this morning. I'm calling all of us to go after this Christ with everything that we have. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that he's a power. He's a living God who can save and transform and renew and sanctify and glorify. God, we thank you for this gospel. And I pray, Lord, for those who have just made peace with immorality, and greed, and lust. Their whole lives are just their little greed how to save up and have all the money that they can have and it's their security and all they're chasing is girls or guys. I pray that your gospel would break that even here this morning. If they have 20 years of religion at Southside Bible Church, God, break it. Don't let them rest and go into a specific church, but only in a Christ who has saved them and transforming them from one image of glory to the next. Let no one have a peace treaty with immorality. God, let all of us rise up and keep fighting this sin and have repentance and faith and, and uh, partakers koinonia with Jesus Christ. Promises from him that will overcome these lies of what will make us happy here and now. God, let us be a people being conformed to the image of Christ by the power of Christ and faith in Christ and abiding in Christ. God, I thank you for this sweet Savior. May he comfort every believing heart here this morning, I pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.